Let's think back a little bit. If you have a function like this, like a straight line, right? We know if you have it in a form like this, it's really easy to find its gradient. Uh, in fact, it's, you don't even really have to find anything. If I gave the equation of the line to you, we spent some time on linear functions, in that form, you would say the gradient is just m, m right? The gradient is just m. We have uh, twisted around the equation of that line such that the gradient is just sitting there. And that's why we call it gradient intercept form. However, if you rewind a little bit and go back to if you didn't know that there was this way to write the equation of a line, you could still find the gradient of it. You would just need two points on there. What would you do with those two points? What would you do? You'd launch into your gradient formula, wouldn't you? Now, help me out here, right? What is the gradient formula in terms of the shape of what you're looking at, right? Well, you need two points, and then you sort of draw this right angled triangle, right? What do you do with this right angled triangle? Uh, really? Really, Pythagoras? For, to, find, to find the gradient? All you need is to compare the rise. Yeah, it's early, I get it. The rise over here with the run over here. It's somewhat arbitrary that we decide to make it rise over run. You could have made it run over rise. But uh, we tend to make y the dependent variable and x the independent one. So this says, how do you change upwards as you change horizontally? And of course, we have values for each of these. If your first point is x1, y1, your second point is x2, y2. What's our, um, what is the value of the rise? What's the top of your gradient formula? What's on the numerator? It's going to be the difference between these y coordinates, right? Which is y2 minus y1. And the same thing for run, except x values, right? OK, so rise over run is really just a nice memorable way of saying, how does the y change? in comparison to how the x changes. So in fact, I'm going to write it like that. Change in y, change in x. OK, so far so good. Now, why do we even care about gradient? Well, in the first place, like all the way back when you first learned the gradient formula, we kind of only care about it because we can work it out. It's like, whoopee, I can actually find this value. It's not too complicated. I can subtract numbers. I can divide numbers. And out pops a gradient. But it's not really clear why this number is important. So let me try and explain a little bit. At the moment, I've lab labeled my axes, or I've sort of implied that my axes are an x and a y axis, right? An x and a y axis. But these axes can refer to anything. For example, if I said this uh, horizontal axis was something like, say, time, and this vertical axis was something like, say, position, then the change in y compared to the change in x would be the same as the change in position compared to the change in time. Right? So this is like a rate, a change in position or displacement is another physics word you might have heard before, uh, versus the change in time. Now, we have units that compare these, right? Like a, a position is like a length of measurement, right? So you might like say that's something like kilometers. That's a, a measure of position, a measure of length. Um, a measure of time that's fairly commonly used is something like, say, the hour, right? So you've got a position, you've got a time. We wouldn't usually write it like this. We would usually write it like that. Which helps you see, when you're measuring something in kilometers per hour, what are you measuring? You're measuring speed or velocity, if you want to be a bit fancier about it, right? So in other words, if you compare these two things and how they change, you get a rate which is important, like which is useful, which applies to a real situation. A rate like speed, OK? So this comparison here, if you compare change, what you get is a rate. And rates are really important because lots and lots of things change. So far, so good. We know why gradient sort of matters, except we really rapidly hit a roadblock. Like we spent a lot of time on linear functions earlier this year. 
but it doesn't take very long to get to functions that are no longer straight lines and which resist this simple way of doing things, right? Um, on that first diagram, you know how I picked those two points? You could pick them anywhere, can't you, right? And you would still get exactly the same result. But this guy is different. If you pick two points, like say here and here, I could find out the gradient between these two points, couldn't I? I could do the same rise over run thing that I did before. But of course, if I pick a different pair of points, excuse me, if I pick a different pair of points, like say this one and this one, you get a whole different gradient, don't you? For example, in this case, your rise is going to be negative, right? And your run is going to be a completely unrelated number. So the reason why we have this problem here is that, well, the gradient keeps changing. There isn't just one gradient all the way along for this straight line. That's why there is no gradient intercept form for a parabola, because the gradient is different wherever you have a look. Okay? So therefore, we're trying to in be interested in this idea of, OK, what is the gradient at each individual point? It can keep changing. right? So we no longer call it a gradient borrowing on some language from our previous topic, we call it a gradient function because it can change, right? So let me just write that down here. The gradient function. Think about all the stuff you know about functions already. In fact, if you still have the pages there, turn back to where we define a function. A function is, if you might remember, I'll give you a bit of a nudge, a function is a special kind of equation. What's special about it? Because not every equation is a function. What's special? Ah, yeah. Okay. So you're, there are there are two variables, right? You put a number in, and you get a number out. Does that make sense? And you only you, every time you put one number in, you only get one number out, as opposed to say a relation, right? So the gradient function is exactly the same. The gradient function is what takes in, like this is the input, it takes in an x value, and what it provides is a gradient, and outputs a gradient. Okay. Now, I've titled this the problem of tangents, because we don't want to have between these two points, because if you have a look, it's not hard to draw. And you can draw this onto your own as well. If I join up these guys here, you don't actually get the gradient at any particular point, because it sort of slices across. Uh, this is not a tangent. This is a secant, right? By the way, secant, secant. It's called a secant because it cuts the shape. right? It cuts the line in a couple of different spots. What we want is a tangent tangent, which as opposed to cutting like a secant, right? like a cross section is something that cuts across. We want something that is tangential. Now what does that mean? What is a tangent? We've heard of this word before to do with circles. Anyone want to give a, um, a one sentence as brief as you can definition of what a tangent is? Yeah. OK, let me repeat that and let me get your ideas on what we think here. The suggestion so far is a straight line, a straight line that touches the, the curve, the shape, the function, only once. There's, there's two things to that, aren't there? Straight line touches only once. What do you think? Does that seem like a reasonable definition? Hmm. You've learnt about tangents in respect to circles so far. There's a straight line. It touches only once. Looks pretty tangenty to me, right? If it were a secant, it would touch twice. Do you agree? Hmm. Straight line? Touches only once, doesn't it? Is it a tangent? So how are you going to fix the definition? It's not a bad definition. It's a good way to start. Someone else want to suggest how we could tweak this. What could we add? Is there something we can add that's going to make this not a tangent and that a tangent? What's the difference between them? Someone else. 
Is there anyone else awake enough to have a think about? We said straight line. And we said touches only once. Any takers? Any takers? Someone else? Someone have a think. Come on, you can all see what it is. What words would you use to describe what's going on? Hmm. Okay, this is tricky, right? I'm gonna give you an informal definition and then you'll see why we're doing this and why we've had to do limits and why we've had to do all these pieces to make sense of it. Here's my informal definition. It just touches only once, right? Now, I get that from the word tangent, tangent. There's lots of words in the English language that have common ancestry, right? There's a word in the English language that starts just the same way and this is what it's talking about. Right? Any takers? The word tangible, right? Tangible, it means you can touch something as opposed to something that's intangible, which you, can, you can't touch, okay? That's what this is really talking about. It just touches and then it leaves off, okay? 